Hey everybody, welcome back. This is part two of my new series called If You Could See How I Feel. I decided I wanted to start another series uh, specifically about invisible injuries um, of all types. And certainly I'll probably spend more time on the ones that I'm most versed in because they're the ones that have impacted me personally. But but I've really, um, in the last couple of years, begun to recognize um, the pervasiveness of this of this issue and um, the the, pre- the prevalence of it. And like I said in my first video, um, it's really opened my eyes in terms of increasing empathy and compassion. Um, I don't know what, you know, we never know what somebody's going through, right? Um, whether that invisible illness or injury is grief or some sort of health issue or autoimmune issue or medication injury, any, any number of things. Um, and when I was looking at the sheer numbers of people just in America that have a chronic medical or mental health issue, um, I was shocked to read that it was one in two. That doesn't mean one in two people are disabled with it, meaning to, to meet criteria for disability and to be able to get on things like SSDI and things like that, you have to be unable to perform certain tasks, uh, usually related to work. Um, but it would be considered dis- disabling if you were a parent and unable to parent, that type of thing. Um, so not one in two are disabled, but one in two are struggling with a chronic, invisible mental health or medical issue. And again, I know I was just in the grocery store the other day and you know, it makes me see everything differently. I'm looking around and there's 40 people in the produce aisle and I'm thinking, wow, you know, there could be 20 people here more or less that are silently suffering, silently struggling, putting on a good face, you know, putting in an enormous amount of effort to live their lives. And I've, like I said, I've always been aware of this, having been a clinician for, you know, a quarter of a century, but, um, you know, you don't know something, or at least I shouldn't say that for everybody, but it took me going through this for me to really grasp the, um, not just the severity and the duration, but just the the impact on a biopsychosocial spiritual level uh, that having an invisible illness or injury has on a human being. So when we're talking, so this this segment is going to be on medication injury, and if you've listened to my hundred or five hundred and five plus benzodiazepine videos above, or you've read my book, you know that medication injury was what got me into this mess, and uh, and um, and so I want to speak about that. The one that got me obviously, as if you know my story, was an antibiotic, a fluoroquinolone called Levaquin. And then this led to being put on um, gabapentin, which is a nerve medication, and alprazolam, which is the generic of Xanax. I was put on those medications to, in theory, calm down my nervous system. Um, I won't go into my story because I do that several places, and if you you know you can look uh, in, in in several places as well as Geraldine Burns' podcast that I did with her, where I go into my story a little bit more. But when we're talking about medication injuries, you know, think about when you, what you see on TV now. You know, you see these, uh, you know, people sitting in bathtubs overlooking an ocean. You know, um, I think that's probably for some erectile functional medication. I can't remember, but, but you know, you see these, you know, these people running through fields and sitting in bathtubs overlooking oceans and picking up their kids, and and then there's this small print. And a really, really fast voice that says everything from, you know, gas with early discharge to potentially disabling central nervous system issues. And again, gas with early discharge, gross, okay, but probably survivable. Uh, Central nervous system uh, issues, more of a problem. Um, And unfortunately, that's what gets a lot of people in this. And I'll kind of explain that. So whether we're talking about antibiotics, whether we're talking about antidepressants, Benzodiazepines, which are Xanax and Clonopin, Ativan, Valium, uh, Temazepam, um, whether we're talking about steroids, uh, gabapentin, blood pressure medications, hormones like thyroid hormones or progesterone and estrogen, PPIs, proton pump inhibitors. It's like all different types of psychotropic medications, psychiatric meds, Accutane. I mean, the list goes on and on. And the reality is, is we don't really have accurate numbers of all these injuries. And there's a reason for that 
Because oftentimes um, when people are injured by a medication or have a adverse reaction to a medication, um, you know, there is a way to report that to the FDA um, and so that they can keep track of these adverse events, which we need to make sure we're doing. But unfortunately, what ends up happening is people just like me, are in, we end up on two or three other medications to cover up the illness or injury that was caused by the original medication. That's why when I had the neurotoxic reaction to the antibiotic, I had had no previous mental health or medical complicated history. And as a result, you know, landed on gabapentin and, um, and Xanax. And, you know, even though I'm off the gabapentin, I cannot get off the Xanax. I'm having a very, very, very hard time. And it has been life limiting <clears throat> to say the least. But this isn't just about, again, my story. This is about, again, I just mentioned a few and I, I'm mentioning the ones that people are writing to me about blood pressure medications, things that you really wouldn't think about that when you look deeper, some of these blood pressure medications actually have secondary benefits for things like mood stabilization. So think about that. If, if, if there's a kind of an off label potential use of a blood pressure med to be used for people with bipolar disorder and you potentially have a, a, a not so good reaction to this medication, either on it or coming off, wouldn't it make sense that potentially there, there might be a psychiatric reaction? Um, and I've talked to people that have had all kinds of reactions from steroids. In fact, I've known three people that were put on benzodiazepines because they had a bad steroid. They had a, they had a steroid injection in their back and they were put on benzodiazepines as a result of that. And then now they're having a hard time coming off the benzo. Gabapentin is a widely used medication. It's used off-label for insomnia and anxiety. It's used on-label for nerve pain, neuropathic pain. <clears throat> and I have a, a, a dear friend who is a psychiatrist and an internist who sees people in his ER pretty regularly who look psychotic. And then he digs deeper and finds out that they stopped their gabapentin. They weren't even on high doses. Sometimes they're on 300 milligrams, which is a relatively small dose of gabapentin. But when they stop taking it, they can appear psychotic. And what does he learn to do? He puts them back on it. They clear within a couple of hours. They're fine, even though they were running around naked three hours before. And then they have to taper off slowly. If you are somebody like me who's had a problem with uh, benzodiazepines, mine is Xanax. I can't taper fast. Um, if you know, I, I've tried to come off of it quickly before, and it has proven to be disastrous. I lost my, I had to step away from my career as a result of that. Temporarily, I'll get back to it, but still. And the same thing, like even with antidepressants. You know, these the antidepressants. I was talking to somebody the other day, and I want to say something about this because it's really important because if you were watching my benzodiazepine videos you saw one that I did about Claire Weeks and she talks about kind of a natural byproduct of, of dealing with anxiety for so long is depression but this person had a really good point and and I wanted to come back and speak to that now which is what I hear often from people um, when they've been on antidepressants short or long term is that when they are tapered off and remember, in the medical establishment, the mental health establishment, if you're even tapered, a taper is usually considered six to eight weeks, okay? And when you get on to, um, and you start looking into things like Surviving Antidepressants, the website that has tens of thousands of members from all over the world, um, a six to eight week taper is, is in essence the equivalent for many people of a cold turkey. And what will happen is people will actually do fine in the tapering process. And they'll find themselves a week off, three weeks off, months off, having extreme symptoms. So whatever depression they were put on to begin with is now, you know, a hundredfold. And of course, what are they told? It's just, it's just your depression that came back to roost. You need to go back on the antidepressant. But if you talk to people, again, they're saying like, this is not the depression I felt when I started Zoloft. This is not the depression I felt when I started Cymbalta. It's not the depression I was feeling when I started Effexor. And now coming off of it after a rapid taper, I'm now spending months to years in hell um, with, you know, with again, this, this, this what, you know, what I, I kind of call chemical depression and chemical terror um, that is fueled by what I believe to be an injury. Um, and I think it's an, you know, 
I've, I've been trying to understand this. And again, even though I'm a clinician, this is not medical advice intervention. It's meant to be informational, educational only. Take from it what makes sense. But from what I've been able to ascertain from all of these different people that are writing me, from the research I've been doing, is it what appears to be happening is there's two parts, it seems like, of the body that either get inflamed, injured, or there's a toxicity. And that is the gut and that is the limbic system. Now, you know, I, like I said, I knew or I, it was told to me finally, eventually after my antibiotic, after about three months that I had a neurotoxic reaction, that for whatever reason, you know, just three doses of this antibiotic was enough to basically destabilize my central nervous system. I had a neurotoxic reaction to it. Um, but again, I think about the limbic system. And if you want to learn more about that, I have lots of videos on it. But you know, again, our limbic system uh, is our mammal brain. It, in, it includes um, our command center for our entire body. So it would make sense that, you know, any number of symptoms that you have, if there's an injury and inflammation or a toxicity to that limbic system, it could affect your cardiovascular, your respiratory, your digestion, your sensory organs like your skin, um, vision, auditory. Um, it can affect um, balance. It can affect, obviously, mood. Um, memory, cognition. I mean, really no no stone is left unturned once you hit that limbic system. And so, you know, again, there's just not enough kind of written about that I can find anywhere that I have found that can explain why, what really happens to folks when they have these adverse reactions to these medications. And again, it's everywhere, guys. I mean, you know, again, I, I can't stress enough, like watch those commercials and I'll never, <laughs> I'll never watch one of those commercials the same way again now that I've been burned by at least two medications. Um, I was cold turkey to have gabapentin. I, I didn't know about gabapentin at that time, so I don't know how much that contributed to my injury. But I know for sure the benzodiazepine and the antibiotic um, you know, we're, we're a hundred percent contributing factors to my going from basically a functioning human being who was happy, uh, to, and living a large life to really working hard to stay vertical and breathing and, and wrap my head around what had happened to me. So again, um, you know, I, I think that if, if I'm right in, in any way that, that our gut, which is oftentimes seen as our second brain, and our gut gets completely impacted by things like antibiotics, antidepressants, benzodiazepines, um, psychotropic medications, PPIs, um, uh, you know, things like that. Think about like Accutane. You know, Accutane is like what you know medication for that we put our, our a lot of our teenagers on, or at least used to. And we know for sure that this is linked to uh, suicidality. And we've seen disastrous things happen with Accutane. Okay, so you know. I have become really leery um, about uh, psychopharmacology um, and pharmacology in general, not suspicious, not um, paranoid, but I, I read the fine print. I ask the questions. I instruct my family, please don't stick something in your body that you haven't researched fully and that you have full informed consent and that we've looked at the black box warnings, if any exist, and we know what's going on. And had I done that with, for myself, I would have found Benzo buddies and, you know, the tens of thousands of people on Facebook saying what had happened to them with their fluoroquinolone or with their benzodiazepine. I didn't do that. I'll never not do that again. Um, but this invisible illness and this invisible injury that comes as a result of medication adverse reactions and, and medication injury, um, <clears throat> along with that comes um, usually a lot of shame. Um, I think this is probably part of invisible illnesses in general. Um, we, we often blame ourselves. I know I did. Why did I take this? Why didn't I further investigate? I was also angry. Why didn't my pharmacist and my doctor explain this to me? Why didn't, why did, why, why didn't anybody slow down and, and help me figure this out? Um, so there was shame, there was anger, there was, you know, some hopelessness. Um, and, and there's that, 
again, that secondary trauma that goes along with invisible illness and injury where nobody can see that we're, you know, struggling with, you know, despair or, or, you know, strange thoughts or our memory, our memories of things feel distorted or our cognition is affected uh, or, you know, we, we struggle to just kind of get up and, 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 and live our lives in a functional way, we get kind of written off, right? And, and again, this struck me when I decided, when I really learned like one in two, one in two Americans are walking around with some sort of chronic mental or medical uh, condition that's invisible and impacting their lives. And so I think this can go a long way, like I said, in terms of us not feeling so alone and you know what i can say about the 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 the, the psychotropic medications um, benzodiazepines and, and things like that is i can't tell you the number of peop- number of calls i get from people that want to talk about this but say you know obviously you know please keep this private which of course i would but people saying things like i don't want anyone in my neighborhood to know i don't want my friends or family to know i've got little kids i don't want them to know that i took this medication and that I'm so sick on it or sick coming off of it. Um, I don't want them to think I'm crazy. I don't want this to impact my family's life um, in, the, in our community. And, and it, it's heartbreaking, right? Because I'm watching these people just do everything they can to pull themselves up each day and face the day feeling terrible. And not only are they not met with validation um, and a lot of support, from the medical or mental health establishment. And I'm not saying across the board, I'm not making a blanket statement, but unfortunately I'm seeing a heck of a lot more on the side of not being met with validation and support and being met with, okay, well, I think I've told you guys this, like, you know, for me personally, this, 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 this plays in because I, um, you know, had no clinical diagnoses prior to this happening. And if I walked into a psych hospital tomorrow, I would meet criteria for five different diagnoses. I've said this so many times. That's terrifying. Um, And so what happens is it's not that these doctors um, and therapists and psychiatrists and and internists, whatever, it's not that they don't care or that they, you know, um, are are necessarily malintent, operating with malintent. It's they're doing what they are trained to do, right? Which is look at symptoms and give what they have to offer. Well, I believed in that approach until it bit me in the ass. Um, and sometimes I, I think about, okay, why did this happen to me? And, you know, sometimes I'll frame it like maybe I had to go through this so that one of my kiddos that I love in my life and in my family, um, you know, we, we, we're going to pump the brakes and they're not going to have to go through this. Maybe we're all going to pay attention a little bit closer to what we're putting in our bodies and making sure that we're really asking the questions. And knowing that even when we ask the questions, there's still not very good answers. And I talk about this all the time. You know, we, we've gotten so specialized now in medicine. Uh, let's just take, you know, th- that, that approach. That, you, that people sometimes have four or five or six different specialists they see, but they don't have a generalist. They don't have somebody that's looking at the whole picture for them and paying attention to the fact like, oh, you know, you're on gabapentin and a benzo and a PPI and a this and a that and a mood stabilizer. And they're on five, six, seven different medications. And although it might all be in their chart, there is no, there are no studies. There is nothing that exists that, 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 that says, you know what, it's, perfectly safe for a human being to take these five medications in concert with each other. It doesn't exist. There's not even very good long-term studies on most medications in general, certainly not psychiatric medications. But my point is, is that even when we ask the questions, you know, we're often met with, you know, yeah, it it really shouldn't be a problem. But like I said in my book, you know, when it is a problem, when you're the one, it is a big problem. It is your problem. And you're left alone then to deal with that. And I think one of the things that's really frustrating to me <clears throat> is, you know, we will sometimes hear from people, you know, yeah, because uh, basically it's all anecdotal evidence, right? If you walk into your, you know, your, your gastro doctor and they can see you're on five other meds 
and they're thinking, well, you know, I don't think, I don't know of anybody that, you know, has blown up because they took these five things. Well, that's anecdotal evidence. Those are stories that you heard or you didn't hear, right? And it's amazing to me that we can give a lot of um, primacy to that and a lot of emphasis on anecdotal evidence of, I don't think it should be a problem, right? Until, like, for example, for me, I get injured by an antibiotic or benzodiazepine, and I'm like, here's 100,000 pieces of anecdotal evidence that I can find. And they'll say, yeah, but there's no studies. There's no clinical studies that show benzodiazepines can actually cause the type of withdrawal experience you're having. So it's really ass backwards. And I'm saying all of this just to say, that, again, not to throw doctors or therapists or clinicians or psychiatrists or anybody under the bus. It's to say that I think there is much more that is not known than there is that is known. And, you know, the other piece that we have to pay attention to is that the studies that are being done, we want to look and see who's funding the studies. You know, is it the pharmaceutical industry that's, ph- that's, that, that's, that's funding the study? You know, is it the pharmacy? You know, we, we, we read books. We, we know it's not a, it's, it's not a surprise that, um, I forget the guy at Sloan Kettering who spoke out about the fact that, you know, the, the reps that come in, um, and work with the doctors pushing their product, that product is going to be more widely used, even if it's not the best product. So this stuff is still happening, you know, and again, this isn't, um, you know, bad doctors or a bad person. Um, it's, it's, it's the fact that there's a, not a lot known. There's a lot of certainty that's kind of being thrown around about medication, medication injury, adverse effects, and then we get people on a roller on a hamster wheel of other medications to try to treat the symptoms from the steroid injection that went wrong, or from the antibiotic that that somebody had a you know developed um, you know C diff from, or the you know antidepressant that they've come off of too rapidly and now they're you know horrifically depressed you know a hundredfold from what they first experienced, and what are we met with more medication. Um, so we've got to do this, and I think that that as we think about the world of invisible illnesses, this is a big part of our world, because you know we are out there. Um, you know, just again, just think about this one class of medication that I've described: benzodiazepines. Right in 2019, so pre-COVID, there were over 90 million prescriptions written for benzodiazepines pre-COVID. So pre the you know the the pandemic creating anxiety and insomnia and stress for people right i don't even want to think about what those numbers look like now and the numbers of people that were put on antidepressants um sleep aids all kinds of things so one class of medication out of what i've just described has over you know over 90 million prescriptions 3 years ago so we're we're dealing with a lot of people now are most people injured by medications no i don't think they are um Unfortunately, I think the numbers are a lot higher than we know, and I think they're a lot higher than the doctors even know. Um, and and you know we, we just think, well, if something you know didn't agree with you. Now we're going to put you on two other things. And so I just want us to to slow down and, and really think about again the the secondary trauma not being part of that problem, um, giving people the benefit of the doubt. Um, like I said, I, it, it, you know, as, as much as I want to feel better, and I know one day I will, uh, I certainly have had an increase in my own empathy towards other people, realizing the sheer numbers of people that are out there walking around um, with things I can't see. Uh, they don't have a cast. They don't have a crutch. They don't have a wheelchair. Um, there's nothing I can see visibly, but there's something going on behind the scenes that's keeping them from being able to feel you know, like they can function to the best of their abilities, at their highest capacity, I should say. And um, and I guess that's the gift in this, right? I mean, it's the curse that this happened to me, but the gift is that I can now think about other people and we can think about other people. Um, thanks for listening, guys. And um, I'll come on probably in a day or two into a, a third segment. Take care.